The Hound of Cullen When the Celts came to Ireland, they drove the godlike Tuhade Daum underground into the many fairy mounds dotted across the country. The Tuha became known as the Seal, pronounced She, and fairies, and though they no longer ruled the land, they became a feared presence in the Irish people's lives for thousands and thousands of years. This is the story of a gift the She gave Ireland, a baby who would grow up to become their greatest hero. Ooh, we like a good introduction to a story. I'm not gonna lie, that was pretty good. Many years before our story starts, King Connor of Ulster woke up to discover that his sister, Deirdre, and 50 of her maids had disappeared without a trace from the royal fort. For years, the king's men searched for them, but the girls were nowhere to be found and one could not hide nor hair of them. Rumours spread that the girls had been snatched by the fairy she and were taken to the land of youth or Tirnanog. But one day, while hunting in the forest for birds, Fergus MacRoy, one of the king's trusted men, saw light coming from the fairy mound. This was most unusual for the doors to these mounds were normally never opened by mortal men. Stepping inside, Fergus realized that the light was not coming from the mound itself, but from a man with long golden hair. Fergus knew it to be the Tuhade Dawan god Lu, of the long arm, and beside him stood a woman that Fergus recognized immediately. It was Deirdre, the king's missing sister, and she looked as young as the day she had gone missing, even though many years had passed. Fergus immediately wanted to make Deirdre come back with him to the king, but she refused to go anywhere because she was so happy with Lou in Tirnanog. Okay, spoiler alert, this is not the story I know. So what I remember is the fact that Deirdre was getting married to um, Fergus, but she disappears on her wedding day. And what happened was she drank a cup of wine that a little fly had fallen into, but the fly had been Lou. And the fly turned Deirdre into like um, a golden bird and 50 of her handmaidens all got turned into like white doves or something and they flew away to Tirnanog. So do you, do you see already like how there's alterations in the myth? Sorry, I'm back to your previously wanted program. My life won't be worth living if I return to the king's empty handed, said Fergus. He misses you sorely. Then take my child to comfort my brother, she said. Again, straight away, there's such a difference because Deirdre goes back to Fergus, has the child, and stays there. Mate, mate, mate. Why can't we just have one? It's almost like Chinese whispers, isn't it? Then take my child to comfort my brother, she said, handing Fergus a baby, and raise him well. He shall be the greatest warrior Ireland has ever known. The baby was taken back to Ulster amid much celebration. Everyone argued who should care for the royal child. And in the end, King Connor decided that everybody would have a hand in rearing him. He would be the greatest of warriors. He would be the greatest of poets, the greatest of men. And indeed, the king himself was a regular presence in the child's life. And the boy was named Setanta. Or Satanta, wherever you're from. Even at the age of six, Satanta had the makings of a great warrior, as his mother had predicted. Knowing that he needed training in order to hone his skills, the king invited Satanta to his fort to audition for his troop of trainee soldiers, the Red Branch Knights. What if I don't get in? Satanta asked his foster mother. She kissed his forehead. Just show them how brave and strong you are. He took his hurley, stick and slither, a very special ball needed for hurling, a spear and his toy shield and set off for the journey. Again, again, another, another deviation. What I remember is that Satanta, with his mother Deirdre, wanted to go play at the Maka, which is where a bunch of boys and girls who were training to be warriors played hurling. Because in ancient Ireland, hurling, which is our national sport, was actually a form of combat. It was like training, basically, for war. 
and now it's um, probably one of the most vicious and fast sports played on grass. If you've never seen a hurling game, look it up on YouTube. It is it is violent. <laughs> you get out a lot of anger when you play hurling. I should have played hurling today. I would have made county. He passed the time by hitting the slither great distances into the sky and launching his spear after it. And he would then run and catch first the slither and then the spear before they hit the ground. When Satanta arrived at the king's fort, he found the Red Branch boys playing a game of hurling in the green. Green? Yeah, okay, fine. We're back on track. Never one to pass an opportunity, Satanta rushed headlong into the game, taking the ball past one player, then another, and scoring a goal. But the boys were much older than Satanta and were not very impressed by this little stranger joining their game uninvited, and they belted their slithers at him. Next, they launched their spears at him, but he deflected the ball, and he deflected the spears with his shield, and finally they attacked him. The young Satanta face distorted with anger, his eyes rolling into the back of his head and his teeth bared like a dog's. A strange light radiated from his head. The boys did not know what was happening, but they were witnessing the light of the god Lu, Satanta's father shining out of him, and they were so shocked by the sight that they were unprepared for Satanta's attack. Satanta took the boys one by one and beat them all. And when the king heard about this fearless newcomer, he knew that it could only be one person, Satanta. And he invited him to join the boys' troop of Red Branch Knights. What about my audition? asked Satanta. The king laughed and pointed to the 20 Abash boys. You've had it. You've passed. For the next few months, Satanta trained in the disciplines of poetry, music, fitness, and fighting, and indeed proved himself to be a champion of all of them. He soon became leader of the troop, and the favorite to the king, and quite an achievement for a seven-year-old. So much so that the King Connor was invited to a feast of the blacksmith Cullen, and he asked Satanta to come along as his guest. But this was such an honor for Satanta, because Cullen was renowned as one of the finest weapon makers in the entire land. But however, when the time came to depart for Colin, Sfort, Satanta was in the middle of a game of hurling, and he didn't want to leave it. I'll follow behind, he told the king. Connor, who normally wouldn't have accepted this insolence from anyone, was charmed by the boy's dedication to the king, to the game. So he smiled, nodded, and set off in his chariot. After the game of hurling, which unsurprisingly, Satanta's team won, the boy headed in the direction of Colin's fort. He passed the time by hissing his slither into the sky and running ahead to catch it. But meanwhile, at Colin's fort, King Connor arrived with his men and was invited into a magnificent feast which had fresh boar meat, badger flesh, honey, and the finest of wine served in goblets. Who guards your fort while we feast? asked the king. I need no guards, replied Colin, for I have the best guard dog in the country. A wolfhound as large as a bear and as fierce as a wolf. Wolves and bears do not populate Ireland anymore. So, um, yeah. The king laughed and tucked into the food, forgetting Satanta was coming. But outside Colin's fort, his wolfhound prowled. The beast had sharp eyes. He had pointy ears and dagger-like teeth. And it was almost dark by the time Satanta reached the fort, but from inside he could hear music and chatter and laughter of the banquet, but he could not hear the noise of the dog, its low threatening growl like a rumble of thunder, until it was too late. From out of the shadows pounced the great Irish wolfhound, and the boy had only just seen him in time. It was the same height as Satanta. Its eyes seemed to burn red with fire and the drool that flew from its bared fangs as it bounded across an open space towards the boy. But with no time to run away, Satanta lifted his hurley. Pulling his arm back, he drove his slither as hard as it could down the mighty beast's mouth. The ball whistled through the air like an arrow, flying straight down the hound's open mouth, and with an ear-piercing squeal, the dog dropped dead to the ground. Colin and the king and all the guests rushed out to see what had happened 
and where the infernal noise was coming from. In the moonlight, they saw the seven-year-old Satanta, hurley in hand, standing over the lifeless body of Colin's hound. The king had forgotten about Satanta, arriving late, and was revealed or relieved to see the boy unharmed. Colin, on the other hand, was distraught by the loss of his guard. Who will protect my family now? He said, running for the, his fingers through the dead animal's fur. Find me a pup of the same breed, said Satanta, and I will raise him to be your guard hound. But until then, I will protect your family. I will guard your fort. I will be the hound of Cullen. The king was impressed by the boy's courage and generosity and asked if Cullen was happy with this arrangement. The smith said he was, and from that day on, Satanta was known only by his new name, Ku Cullen, the Hound of Cullen.